Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to our VR, VMR community for a very special uh, virtual morning report. Um, for those of you who are, who are hanging out in the back room, uh, we're going to get started. And for those of you who just joined, uh, we're super excited to be um, to be tag teaming this case with our friends from VCU Internal Medicine. Um, you can see them there. They actually um, have a whole um, room full of uh, trainees and learners who are kindly waving at you. And uh, for those of you at VCU, welcome to the VMR community. It's a, it's a global community of people in various stages of learning. Some have joined us from high school and some have had uh, much more experience in medicine than I. Um, and we're excited to uh, partner together and do the thing we love, which is to get to know each other medicine and, the, and get to know each other better in the context of medicine. Um, uh, my name is Robbie. I'm one of the CP Solvers team members and a, a self-proclaimed clinical reasoning junkie. Um, and I will pass the mic to my dear friend, Jack Penner, to say a quick hello before we talk about um, what we're going to do today. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you. I'm Jack. I'm also one of the CP Solvers team members and will also um, uh, assume the title of a self-proclaimed clinical clinical reasoning junkie. Um, uh, yeah, it is great to see everybody here. Um, and yeah, I just, uh, um, uh, I can't wait to get started and, and so grateful for the opportunity to, to learn alongside all of the residents from VCU and want to give a huge shout out and thank you to Anne-Marie for um, putting in a ton of effort to organize um, to organize these sessions um, and VMR as a whole. So thank you so much, Anne-Marie, for all the work that went into to, um, to setting this up. And yeah, can't wait to get started. It's great to see everyone. Thanks, Jack. Thank you for um, highlighting Anne-Marie's legendary status. Anne-Marie runs all that is VMR. Um, and to her, we are forever grateful. She's accompanied by uh, many people here today, including Rafa and Brody, who are um, who are um, CP Solvers friends who've been doing this for a while. Um, a lot of the team is here, including Gabby, I see, and Travis is also here. Charmaine is also hanging out with us. And I wanted to especially thank um, Kelly. Uh, Kelly Tran um, has been a VMR member for a long period of time now and um, is now behind the scenes actually doing teaching points today because she's working with Travis on her teaching elective. So thank you, Kelly, for jumping in. And I, I love the tree. It looks really pretty. Um, as a quick um, sort of uh, orientation to those of you who are new to the VMR st um, uh, setup, we always discuss one case over an hour. And as Jack alluded to behind the scenes, the goal is not to um, nail the diagnosis. The goal is to um, rejoice in the most amazing thing we do in medicine, which is to think. No matter what specialty you're in, especially if you're an inter internist, your main procedure is to think critically about um, the patient in front of you. And um, we do it internal medicine style where we take our time and really dissect the data. Uh, but the thing we celebrate the most is, um, is how hard it is to, um, to be able to, how, to, how hard it is and endless it is to take on the journey of learning and growing. And um, as Jack will say, our favorite words are, I don't know. And so um, our main goal is to empower you to be comfortable voicing precisely what you do know um, and celebrating even more what's left to learn and what's left to conquer in terms of your knowledge. And we're excited that three people are going to be joining us in the lukewarm seat. Um, maybe we can go around and have our VCU friends say a quick hello. Starting with our case presenter, Jude. Hello. Hey, everybody. I'm Jude. I'm one of the third year medical residents, and I'll be a presenter for today. Wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Jude? Where's yeah, so, Joy? Yeah, so I'm um, not from the US. I went to medical school in Lebanon, and I moved here for residency. So I'm really Amazing. Wait, can I hear Lebanon? Yeah. Here. Here. yeah. That's where I'm from. Where'd you go to? Oh, no way. I went oh. to UB, American University of Beirut. Amazing. Well, well uh, fun fact, um, AUB is one of the only places you can take the MCAT abroad, which is my favorite fun fact about AUB. And, um, yeah, I am I am from Zahli, and um, I'm sure that will give us plenty to talk about offline. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, I'm happy. Excited to be here. Oh, wonderful. And, uh, Hi, I'm Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Jonathan. Say, hey, I'm Jonathan. I'm one of the other third year residents here at VCU. I've been in Virginia my whole life. So I've done the tour of Virginia. So, yeah. That's awesome. My, uh, my older brother lives in Blacksburg and we visited him um, three or four years ago. And so I, uh, I've gone to mini tour of Virginia and excited to meet people who've been there their whole life. That's awesome. All right. Last but not least. Um, I am Marina. I am 
one of the other third year residents here at VCU. I'm actually from the Midwest. I grew up in Indiana, went to med school at Indiana University, and I am headed back there for cardiology fellowship next year. And um, Jonathan um, did not say, but he's also matched into cardiology here in Virginia. Ooh, amazing. Uh-oh. Two car future cardiology fellows. <laughs> Jude, you better have an EKG at some point in this case. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise we'll ask for one. <laughs> Baseline. Amazing. Well, um, Jude, we'll pass the mic to you to get us started for the case. And uh, uh, um, I will, uh, since I rambled away, we'll pass the mic to Jack to kick us off to pair with one of you for the first talent quad. Awesome, awesome. Um, Marina, why don't why don't why don't we pair up together for the first talent quad if that's okay with you? That sounds great. Awesome. Hopefully it's chest pain or shortness of breath that we're going to be starting with. Fingers if, crossed. If that is the case, I will get to say the second three greatest words in VMR after I don't know, which is nothing to add, which means that you yes. all have crushed it and covered everything. Fantastic. All right. So I'm going to get started with our chief complaints. Um, two months of watery diarrhea and nausea and vomiting for about a week. Sorry, Marina, it's not chest pain or shorts. <laughs> All right. All right, so I'm going to start with some, the HPI. Um, so this is a 31-year-old male who presented to the emergency department with a two-month history of non-bloody watery diarrhea, five to six episodes a day with no relation to food or to any specific um, time of the day. He's also endorsing intermittent nausea and vomiting for the last week or so. Um, denied any abdominal pain and his emesis was non-bloody. Another pertinent uh, point is that he notes that his current symptoms started after a flu-like illness about two months prior that lasted for approximately a week and a half and consisted of a cough and a sore throat for which he took over-the-counter cough and cold medicine and his symptoms had resolved. Since then, however, he started to feel progressively more fatigued and his symptoms of diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting had started then. Well, his diarrhea initially, and then ultimately the nausea and vomiting um, more recently. All right, it seems like there, um, um, is this an okay spot to pause? Yeah. Awesome. Well, you know, we have a ton to unpack here. Maria, I will turn it over to you to share your thoughts on sort of this, this general clinical syndrome that we have of a young, a young man with chronic watery diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting after a, what sounds like an acute transient flu-like illness. Yeah. So I think you summed it up really perfectly there. So a 31 year old guy who's kind of chronic seems like since it's been going on for about two months, but then the nausea vomiting times a week after a flu-like illness sounds like some sort of maybe post-infectious gastroenteritis. Would be my first thoughts. Um, I think um, my first question, I guess, for Jude would be, um, is there any new medications or um, treatment that this patient got for their flu-like illness or any evaluation there? So no new medicines um, other than the over-the-counter medicines that he was using for the cough and the sore throat, but he had since stopped using them. Um, any uh, new dietary changes? None that he can think of. Okay. Um, do you want to give us a little bit of, um, I guess, in, in other review of systems questions? So it sounds like we have watery diarrhea, no abdominal pain, um, non-bloody nausea, vomiting. Um, any other 
review systems question to urinary lung cardiac, perhaps that <laughs> came up. Um, so you're asking about his urinary habits. Urinary. So he was saying that he was urinary urinating more frequently than normal. That he was waking up more often at night to urinate. So nocturia. Um, and then I think something else that was pertinent was he denied any weight loss or weight gain. Yeah. yeah. And that's a good point. I, I, I didn't say this out loud, but, you know, of course, when I think about review systems, the first thing I think about is the general review system. So weight loss, fatigue, fever, some of those generalized symptoms. Um, and has he had any fevers? Uh, no fevers. Okay. Marina, you know, I will say, I think, um, I think that um, your initial approach to sort of to better to better understanding what's happening for the background in in this patient is a spot on initial place to start. Because I think one of the right, like, if we just sort of zoom out and think about generally what what exactly we're tasked with at this part of the case, it's that we are sort of doing our best to organize his symptoms in a way that will help us start to move through thinking about how we can reconcile this clinical presentation with, with some sort of final diagnosis. And so the questions that you're asking as we try to build an illness script for what this patient's clinical presentation is, I think are, are absolutely spot on in terms of thinking about not, not necessarily further quantifying the patient's abdominal symptoms, but further, but further quantifying the company that these, that these abdominal symptoms keep because that can be super helpful in one of the initial branch points for us when we think about a clinical syndrome of chronic diarrhea, right? Like if, when, when we sort of, sort of ask ourselves, how, how can we start to think through a young man with chronic diarrhea? The first branch point that I often use in any patient with chronic diarrhea is to answer the question, is this an inflammatory diarrhea or is this a non-inflammatory diarrhea? And, and inflammatory diarrhea is usually gonna follow the big categories of diseases that we see in internal medicine all the time, right? We might think about invasive infections. We might think about underlying autoimmune disease, particularly something like, like inflammatory bowel disease. We might think about underlying malignancy, although that would be less common in a younger patient, but certainly something that has to be on the differential. Or are we dealing with a non-inflammatory syndrome that's going to usually either be secretory, osmotic, um, uh, um, uh, or malabsorptive in nature? And I think it can be really difficult to tease that out um, from a from a discussion of the GI symptoms alone, because there can oftentimes be a big overlap, right? We usually think about inflammatory diarrhea as being accompanied by pain or bloody bowel movements, but that's not always the case 100% of the time. So the questions you're asking about other associated symptoms of things like systemic inflammation can help us get a sense of how we can better quantify this clinical syndrome, right? right? Is this an, an, a, um, an inflammatory disease that is having clinical manifestations in the GI tract, or is it gonna be a non-inflammatory process? The other thing that I'm, that, that I'm tracking in my mind, whenever I have a young patient who is coming into the hospital um, uh, with, a, with a clinical syndrome that could be infectious in nature is to want to understand their immune status. Because whether we're dealing with an immunocompetent host or an immunocompromised host will be incredibly helpful in thinking about how, how wide or narrow of a net that we cast when we think about potential underlying, underlying infectious etiologies, right? So is this somebody who has risk factors for HIV infection? Because if we find, right, that this recent febrile illness was something like acute HIV. And now we're seeing some of the, some of the, from some of the post initial uh, infection complications of that, right? That might be something that ends up tilting our analysis. The other thing that I'm tracking in my head is whether or not to use this prior illness as an anchor point in the case, right? Are we going to call this a post infectious diarrhea? Or is this a diarrhea syndrome that has developed and there happened to have been a recent flu-like illness? And I think and I think we have to explore both of those hypotheses as we move forward in the case. So all, all that to say is that if we think about our problem representation, at this point, this is a young person with a recent flu-like illness who has two months now of ongoing watery diarrhea. And I still feel like we need a little bit more information to be able to localize whether this is gonna be an inflammatory diarrhea or or a non-inflammatory diarrhea. And I think once we get more information on that, again, whether, whether the diarrhea is bloody, whether it's associated abdominal pain, 
other underlying features of systemic inflammation, none of which have, have, ne have, um, have necessarily jumped out yet, then I think we can start to be more precise in our, in, our, um, in our initial evaluation in terms of localizing the underlying etiology of the diarrhea. Two more questions, review of systems on that note. With the company, it keeps, I really like that phrase. Um, one other thing I thought of with IBD was, does the patient have any skin rashes? And did they have any, you know, sweating or palpitations? Someone mentioned um, some carcinoid-like syndromes that can cause diarrhea as well. So no sweating, um, palpitations, and um, no rashes that he noticed. Well, Jude, I will um, I will turn it turn it back over to you um, to take us through sort of the next aliphat of information here, but already a super wow. rich start. Sounds good. So his review of system was otherwise negative, except for some muscle cramping that he was noting uh, intermittently, but no joint pains. Um, and then um, I'm going to move on to past medical history. I think that's. The most, the most pertinent information the HPI has already been covered. Um, so he didn't really have any significant past medical history. He was an otherwise healthy 31 year old male. Um, no surgical history either. No new medications or current medications. And then I'm gonna move to social history. So he uh, smokes marijuana about two to three times a week, um, denies any IV drug use, admits to previous cocaine use, um, but denies any recent use, drinks beer and liquor a few days a week, but not every day, um, smokes tobacco occasionally, and then has had for his sexual history, has had multiple unprotected female sexual encounters um, and is now in a monogamous relationship for the last six months. He also manages a small construction company uh, focusing on water and sewer development and has dogs at home. And then for his family history, um, his mother and father had type 2 diabetes. And he um, has a, an allergy to penicillin, described a rash when he takes penicillin. Should I move on to vitals? Please. Thank okay. You. All right. So he was afebrile. His temperature was 36.9 Celsius. His blood pressure was 153 over 108. Heart rate was 79. He was sounding 97% on room air. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to move on to my exam, continue my physical exam. He was, so generally, um, he was well-developed um, in no acute distress. Um, I could see multiple tattoos over his face and extremities. Um, normal cephalic, atraumatic, extraocular movements were intact. He had anecteric sclera, dry oral mucosa, poor dentition, and no oral lesions. For his cardiovascular exam, he was uh, so regular rate and rhythm, normal S1, S2, no murmurs were appreciated. Um, he had strong peripheral pulses, 
Um, we did note, however, trace pitting lower extremity edema and bilateral lower extremity. For the respiratory exam, um, breath sounds were cleared auscultation bilaterally. There was no increased work of breathing, no wheezing. Abdomen was soft, non tender, non distended, and bowel sounds were present. We uh, briefly touched on a skin exam, um, noting the tattoos, but otherwise no rashes were noted. His, I'm going to go back up to the neuro exam. So his cranial nerves, two to 12, were intact. His strength was five over five throughout, and he had an intact sensation. And then for his uh, lymph node exam, he had no cervical, submandibular, or submental lymphadenopathy. So I was going to start, start us off with some basic labs and then potentially pause there. So Perfect. for Perfect. So his CBC, um, so his white count was 7.4. His hemoglobin was 9.6. And platelets were 166. Um, for his BNP, his sodium was 133. Potassium was 3.7. Chloride was 109. Bicarb was 20. BON was 48. His creatinine was 9. Glucose was um, 102. Calcium was 6.3. His um, FOS was 4.6 and his MAG was 1.5. His AST was 45, ALT was 44, FOS was 109, total ability was 0.1, and his albumin was 1.1. And I was going to stop here. You are an incredible storyteller for many reasons, one of which is like you're paying such close attention to um, the scribe and presenting this case so deliberately. So thank you. And two, oh, I feel like I would never ever want to play a game of poker with you because I would lose so easily. Like, you <laughs> You kept your ace card like so well hidden, like, oh, you know, Kratny, just, you know, nine. And, um, <laughs> oh my God. Um, and Jonathan, I feel like, I feel like um, your colleague um, could have easily been a GI fellow and I don't, and clearly chose cardiology. So I'm in awe of what her cardiology skills might be. And I, and I um, have a very high confidence that um, you're in a very similar space. So maybe you can, um, Start us off not so much by touching on everything here, but maybe what your mind is gravitating to and how you're sort of putting um, this case together because we got a lot of data. So what's what's of value to you here in terms of trying to understand what's going on? Yeah, so I think we're really able to put the patient's picture together. We have a young gentleman who was previously seemingly healthy with a chronic syndrome that seems out of proportion to his young health. And then we have findings on exam of edema, which should not be the case in a young gentleman. We have a creatinine of nine indicating likely acute renal failure, but we don't have a baseline. And we have significant hypoalbuminemia. So all of these are like abnormal. Once you start putting it together with the edema and all that stuff, you're starting to hint on a syndrome, uh, like nephrotic syndrome is what's jumping out to me. Uh, calcium is about 8.6 yeah yeah 
corrected calcium of 2.6. And I think what's important here is his vital signs actually look okay. I mean, I know his blood pressure is 150 over 100, but with all the diarrhea that he's been having, he's able to still maintain a good blood pressure. So in the sick versus not sick, at least immediately, maybe we have some time to think about it. Jonathan, I think that your analysis so far is fantastic and absolutely spot on. I'm curious, sort of to building building off of some of those things that you've explored, I'm curious like how how you're integrating the finding of the acute renal failure within the history that we already had, which was the finding of, of or which was sort of this initial presentation of this chronic diarrhea. Yeah. So with chronic diarrhea, I guess we expected his creatinine to be elevated if he had poor PO intake with nausea and vomiting, like maybe a pre-renal type syndrome. However, a creatinine of nine seems to be out of proportion to what one would expect. So that makes me think there's something else going on, not just poor PO intake and hypovolemia that could be easily corrected. So that's why I'm jumping to sort of other diagnoses for him. And also they're highlighting the anemia and thrombocytopenia, which are signs of some chronic illness going on. So, that's pretty low for a 30 year old. That is a, fan, that is a fantastic point, I think. Robbie, I know is is um is going to jump in here. He um, there we Hello. go. He's back. Uh, so <laughs> my fire alarm went off, and I'm in the hallway. Um, in the, in the, in the yes, it's a test. Don't worry. So I caught I caught most of the. I I I couldn't agree more. I um I think it's very tempting to um to try to be systematic. And I think that systematic implies um, that all the data is important. And I don't think that's true in this case. I think, Jonathan, as I heard you um, talk through, emphasizing the creatinine and albumin and invoking the product syndrome is a great operating hypothesis. And um, I, I think that the truth is, in this case, you need way more data to start to um, get to the answer, but starting to formulate it as a GI plus renal syndrome is very wise. Um, the only way we would be wrong by labeling it a GI, as a GI plus renal Not syndrome is to um, uh, is to recognize that the renal syndrome may be purely a volume issue, where the patient's just so hypovolemic that their AKI is actually pre renal. But I imagine the reason, uh, the reason John, uh, Jonathan, that's not high on your list is because the cranine's nine. There's yeah. no way there's a renal injury, right? Um, and I would say if you were to practice, like if you and I were to practice in real time, GI plus renal, of which there are many, but what morbid uh, combinations come to your mind, which we should probably think about earlier, sooner rather than later. So if I tell you somebody has a GI issue and a renal issue, what kind of acute stuff jumps to your mind? Um, Shigella, some sort of infectious diarrheas in that realm. Beautiful. HUS, that's a good one, yeah. Yeah. I think that's superb. Like for all of you li listening to this, the only emergent diagnosis that I can think of right now is hemolytic uremic syndrome. I think that's the only thing that we need to think of instantly. And the good news is we can roll that out by looking at the peripheral smear for schistocytes and um, looking for um, the progression to thrombocytopenia, which isn't this case. And then the truth is there are many combinations of GI plus renal disease. Um, Jonathan, you were mentioning uh, the possibility of nephrotic syndrome, and one notorious trigger of nephrotic syndrome is membranous nephropathy, which can emerge from a colonic tumor, which this, this might be. Um, and um, a lot of patients with, um, with GI malabsorption issues can get oxalate nephropathy because they um, absorb too much oxalate when they malabsorb their calcium. It's a complex dynamic, so we'll have to look out for that. Um, and um, there, there's some rare syndromes where patients can have very specific kind of GI malignancies, specifically villus adenomas, usually in the rectum, that cause devastating kidney injuries, uh, devastating kidney injury through a couple of mechanisms. But to summarize, um, I really commend you for focusing on what's pertinent here. And pertinent here is this, this patient's kidneys aren't working and he's 31. The clues are the GI involvement, um, 
And um, I think understanding the hypoalbuminemia, understanding the nature of the AKI is a glomerular tubular will help us make a lot of progress. But for everyone in the room, I think your move right now is to look at the peripheral smear and make sure there's no schistocytes before you move on. All right, Jude, back to you. Yeah, so no schistocytes were noted on the smear. So I guess moving on. Thank you. What other tests do we want to check? Uh, I would like a urinalysis. All right. So UA, um, so it was yellow, hazy. There was greater than 500 protein. Um, trace leukocytes, negative nitrites, small blood, um, more than 500 glucose negative ketones, um, and then no bilirubin or urobilinogen, and then three RBCs, 58 white blood cells. View back to your test. Yes. Um, Jude, were there um, were there other other pieces of pieces of data you wanted to offer for this for this aliquot, or should Maria and I take a pause and kind of talk through what 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 we want to make of the of the UA here? Uh, we can pause. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, right. 500 glucose, not 4,500, did I say? Yeah. So um, there are some pieces on the urinalysis that may be concerned for different types of nephrotic syndrome. Um, the yellow haziness makes me think of maybe fatty casts that we see in overall nephrotic syndromes. The glucose in, um, you know, some diabetic, nephropathies and then um in as well um it looks like we have a few bacteria small so trace leukocytes maybe some infectious etiology but in the broader picture of this large you know diarrhea and um albumin of 1.1 i think that um i would be interested in the if you were to see a sediment in this, like fatty cast or anything. Yeah, so uh, there were some fatty casts noted on the sediment, but no uh, red blood cell cast. Okay. And Maria, maybe I can ask you just to just to sort of share your thinking out loud what are you what are you thinking as you as as you ask for some of these different findings on the urinalysis yeah so i think when i'm trying to clarify whether this is uh, an underlying nephrotic syndrome something i always try to do is keep in mind how it might tie into the patient's current presentation too so i'm trying to think is this uh, i always ask myself is this an occam's razor case or is this a Hickam's dictum case? Um, and so uh, does he have nephrotic syndrome and another um, inflammatory or non-inflammatory diarrhea process or is it something like IgA or hemolytic uremic syndrome that could explain both of them? I think that that thought process is absolutely phenomenal. And, and again, I, I think like the ways in which you're building off of, um, off of Robbie and Jonathan's discussion of like, as we start to link GI and renal together, we can start to take this one step further and start to link the hypothesis of, of, of not just GI and renal, but GI and nephrotic syndrome, right? So how do we start to, how do we start to connect the pieces of getting the gastrointestinal system on the hook in the setting of somebody who seems to have nephrotic syndrome, because we certainly have many of the clinical features of 
nephrotic syndrome here. We have large proteinuria. We see fatty casts in the urine, which tells us that our glomerulus is also leaking out is also leaking out um, uh, lipids and likely a very large amount of many of the proteins in the setting of this uh, of this acute renal injury. And I think your hypothesis of thinking about hemolytic uremic syndrome, which will usually have um, a larger amount of hematuria or something like something like IgA nephropathy, is spot on. If we just start to sort of like sort of play with the question of IgA nephropathy, right? I think a couple things start to map onto this as a possible consideration. One of them is that sometimes IgA nephropathy can be triggered in a post-infectious state, right? Usually it's within weeks. There's also the form that we think about of like the syn, the syn pharyngitic hematuria, where there's an upper respiratory tract infection at the same time that somebody has underlying hematuria, but there can also be nephrotic syndrome that, that develops a ways down the line. The reason that I'm exploring, or at least kind of pulling on the thread of the IgA nephropathy, the way that you mentioned, is the fact that there's also, we can also link IgA nephropathy with diarrhea through the line of celiac disease. There can be a disease association of IgA nephropathy with underlying celiac disease. And so I'm wondering, right, while we don't have the history that this changes substantially, right, this sort of the clinical syndrome of, of the patient who is having diarrhea that has been ongoing, it seems to be non-inflammatory, potentially bring celiac disease and IG nephropathy on the hook, given that, that, that these are two diseases that have a decent pretest probability in a young patient who has GI complaints and in a young patient who has the finding of nephrotic syndrome. Right? That is one hypothesis to explore as we continue to work up the evaluation of the new nephrotic syndrome, thinking about very common etiology things like HIV, syphilis, hepatitis B, other underlying infections, genetic causes. I think I saw, saw in, um, uh, in the chat some of the, some of the genetic testing that we could send and then also thinking about underlying malignancy. But I love the way that you're being like that, that, you, that you're starting to like to dig into this your analysis to look for more findings and then sort of focusing on at least one of one of the potential links in the chain that help us move from renal syndrome or sorry, um, renal disease with nephrotic syndrome into the GI tract, right? I think as as Robbie and Jonathan mentioned, right, we have to start to, to think about these two things together. And that is, and the, um, the hypothesis of IgA nephropathy is, is certainly one way in which we can connect this clinical syndrome together. Dude, maybe with with that in mind, um, uh, uh, I could certainly go on go on about this for hours. But we'll turn it over to you to continue to give us some more data as we as we get um, uh, as we get close to hopefully what will be um, uh, a final diagnosis in the case. Yeah. So I was looking at the chat, and uh, there's a lot of pertinent tests um, being uh, put out there. So I was going to just ask you guys about what you would need. Now that you're thinking about nephrotic syndrome, I'm like, well, what tests do you need to supplement that? Confirm the yeah. criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to confirm the, the criteria, a urine protein to create an ratio. Yeah. And then um, kind of thinking about the differential diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome and what things could have could cause the different nephrotic syndromes. Um, this patient certainly has risk factors for the hepatitis and HIV, which can lead to uh, FS, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, and some of the other nephrotic yep. that one. All right, so the urine protein to creatinine ratio is actually 12.1 um, milligram protein over milligram creatinine. Um, Pretty significant. The, all the hepatitis serologies were actually negative. Hep C antibody was negative. Hep B surface antibody, surface antigen negative. Um, even Hep E antibody and antigen were checked more negative. HIV was positive. Um, and then a couple of other things that I saw in the chat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so PRP was non-reactive. Um, see what else I saw there. Uh, ANA, I think I saw there too, was negative. Um, stranded DNA was also um, written down, so that was negative. Um, 
I know that there was also somebody who said to check uh, Anka, so we did. Pianka and Sianka were negative two, and then SIGBM was negative. Um, but the UA did have, you know, only had three RBCs, so that would lower on the differential. And then the viral load was positive uh, for one million. HIV viral load it was ten to the power um, of ten to the five. And then cardioglobulin were also ordered, and those were negative. I also saw that um, somebody wrote down anti uh, PLA two uh, R the receptor uh, antibody that was also checked and negative. And then I know that we had mentioned celiac, um, possibly there on the differential, we had checked the tissue transcontaminase antibody IgA, which was also negative. And then a serum and urine immunofixation was also checked. That was negative for monoclonal gammopathy. Yep. I was, was going to stop there. Again, again, just so casually dropping in such an important way. I love it. It's keeping us on the edge of our seats. And for those of us sitting in a stairwell on the edge of the stairs. Um, <laughs> um, Jonathan, Jonathan, where are you at with this? Wow. Um, so what an extensive workup, uh, which is mostly negative. However, we have one thing here, the HIV positivity that I think is going to start to tie this whole case together, both clinically and objectively. So we have a gentleman with a lot of, I guess, risk factors who had this nonspecific viral illness followed by this GI syndrome. Um, and now we have a positive HIV, which is known to cause or at least contribute to causing nephrotic syndrome in the different ways of FSGS membranous nephropathy. So I think that that's probably where we're all going to anchor and sort of work up. But I think before we get too far, since he is having two months of diarrhea and HIV is sort of a known risk factor for certain types of infectious diarrheas, I would actually like to evaluate this diarrhea further, maybe with a GI biofire, at least to rule out that cryptosporidium that we can see that's comorbid. Um, and then maybe ultimately move towards that kidney biopsy for final diagnosis. I think that's superb. I really commend you for not forgetting about the diarrhea and for outlining, outlining your deep knowledge structure of HIV and kidney disease. And um, uh, you know, I'm right there with you. I think this case is very humbling because um, it, it, it goes to show you how important it is to always be dynamic and flexible in your clinical reasoning. Because all of us were thinking this is a case of chronic diarrhea until that creatinine came back. And then I think we rapidly started to reform this case and started to say, hey, this is a little bit of a diarrhea and somebody with really bad kidney dysfunction. So the center of the gra center of gravity of the case changed dramatically with one last value. And so we're not solving a chronic diarrhea case. We're solving a marked acute kidney injury with features of nephrotic syndrome and a little bit of diarrhea case. So all of a sudden the diarrhea becomes a clue, a smaller piece to a much larger, more complicated puzzle, which is uh, acute kidney injury with nephrotic syndrome. And, um, and you, you use that to come to a very robust answer, which is, hey, this is probably HIV-related kidney disease, but I love that you didn't forget your original formulation, which is, well, what's the deal with, with the diarrhea? Um, we may speculate based on the fact that um, this patient is relatively young and um, recently had uh, riskier sexual behavior, that his HIV acquisition might be more recent than one might expect for him to be markedly immunosuppressed. So remember that it takes your CD4 count declines slowly over time. And for the patient to have um, significantly immunocompromising conditions, they usually have HIV for a while, um, where you're talking years. But remember that there is an acute transient drop in the CD4 count shortly after serial conversion. So there's a small risk of the CD4 count plummeting before 200 after serial conversion. So there really is a two, two time points where patients are at risk for things like the things that you mentioned with Gisperdium at all. Um, and that's soon after circumversion and then after HIV, uh, untreated HIV develops into um, AIDS. Yeah. 
Um, but I just wanted to share briefly that the story of HIV and kidney disease is actually a little bit more complicated than meets the eye. Your first instinct when you have somebody with HIV and kidney disease is to make sure that they don't have associated TTP. About 20% of cases of TTP end up being HIV related. So it's not a small number. And you'll see there's a lot of localization in the glomerulus and a lot, lot of localization in the tubular, tubular interstitial. Tubular interstitial disease is usually related to um, certain medications like tenofovir or proteus inhibitors, but can be because of certain fancy infections that affect the kidney um, and um, less common HIV related complications. More commonly, the localization is glomerular, which we've proven here with our proteinuria, and it comes in the form of either nephrotic syndrome, nephritis, or slowly progressive glomerular disease that results in CKD. And here, I think we're making a very compelling case for HIV-associated nephropathy or high band, which is the, the result of kidney disease with overt nephrotic syndrome and usually associated with a very high viral load. Just so you know, unfortunately, a small fraction of patients will get CKD from their HIV despite doing the best they can to control the disease. And that's called the FSGS, despite biological suppression. So the HIV plus, that, plus that kidney disease story is complicated. It involves all, all compartments of the kidney from glomerulus to tubular and cistial to vascular, and it involves a spectrum of presentations from overt nephrotic syndrome to overt nephritic syndrome to slowly progressive um, chronic kidney disease. So here, I think the case is very strong for HIV-associated nephropathy. And what would support that is, as you alluded to, would be a biopsy. Um, which may or may not be necessary. I think that the risks of kidney biopsy are certainly measurable. Just yesterday, we had a patient in the emergency room who actually developed a pneumothorax uh, for the kidney biopsy. Um, and um, the one other thing I'll say is another powerful clue tends to be large kidneys. So when you ultrasound these kidneys, they are um, on a small list of, uh, uh, of uh, conditions that can enlarge the kidney, including um, some less common causes. But um, the, just so you know that list, the, the most common cause of enlarged kidneys is diabetes. So the, um, um, before um, and di diabetic end-stage renal disease, the kidneys can enlarge from diabetes. And then a list of esoteric causes like amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, but HIV-associated nephropathy is on that list too. Um, so we only have a few minutes left, so I'll pass the mic uh, uh, to do to take us home. But I think um, both of you have guided us to um, to a very good working hypothesis. And um, But knowing June, she might throw in another surprising test to take us <laughs> Surprises for this case. Um, but the CT4 count was actually 177 when it eventually came back. Um, the renal ultrasound actually didn't show any evidence of uh, enlarged kidneys, but did show increased cortical echogenicity, indicating evidence of significant bilateral medical renal disease. Um, this patient under what we he, had, he ended up with a kidney biopsy um, that came back showing the uh, characteristic findings of collapse, a collapsing form of focal segmental uh, glomerulosclerosis accompanied by microcytic tubular dilation and interstitial inflammation. Um, what, from what I've read, uh, a biopsy is necessary because oftentimes, even when HIV-associated nephropathy is suspected, um, about 50% of the time the biopsy will come back in one of the studies that they looked at, about 50% of the time, the biopsy findings will confirm that, but oftentimes it can show classic FSGS or membrane proliferative or others. So um, just to consolidate the diagnosis, that biopsy in this case was necessary. Um, and then just another uh, point too, we ended up do getting the, the biofire, uh, which was negative. And then he ultimately underwent a colonoscopy uh, to rule out CMB uh, uh, as a cause of diarrhea. The, bio, the immunohistochemical staining was negative for CMB. Ultimately, we didn't really have a great um, explanation for the diarrhea, but uh, thought that maybe you know the acute HIV infection could be definitely contributing, although we didn't have a source of, uh, to pin it on an infectious source. Yep, and uh, he was also started on uh, retroviral antiretroviral therapy um, because you know the thought that this is contributing to his clinical picture. And uh, usually, it's a late manifestation of HIV infection, um, um, and you know, CD4 counts are usually less than two hundred when we see this. Amazing.
Thank you so much, Drew. That was an absolutely fantastic case. Brilliantly put together, like from the um, the artistry and the theater of clinical reasoning was on full display. And I just, I, I appreciate so much the thought that went into the sequencing of the data, the ways in which it was, it was, it was ultimately, ultimately laid out and made for an incredibly compelling discussion. So I just want to give a huge round of applause for you. It takes a ton of work to put together a case like this. Um, you did an absolutely phenomenal job. Before turning it over to Brody for the teaching points, I want to open it up to Marina and Jonathan. Any reflections on this case overall now that we've sort of seen it from start to finish? Um, I think I spent a lot of time trying to connect the two. One, the CMV I, I forgot about, and it's so easy to, once you get that HIV diagnosis, to be completely thrown into one realm or the other. But I think... Um, it was it was a good way, like you said, the way that you presented it to talk through in a way where we could break up the differential and connect those two things. Yeah, I think I agree. We, we're trying to sort of connect the GI and the renal, which, yeah, they were sort of connected maybe, but maybe not. So it's always good to sort of connect when you can, but also take a step back and make sure you're not missing things. A hundred percent. I think that that both of those re reflections are absolutely phenomenal. And I and I, I think for me going through a cognitive autopsy was that I, was that was a a um, uh, in my mind like if we had a ward cloud of the case, um, nephrotic syndrome was of probably too similar of a size to the diarrhea um, uh, uh, compared to what the case actually warranted here. Um, I think like so the the um, the law of proportionality that like we should put the um, uh, commensurate amount of cognitive energy and diagnostic weight into, into um, features of the case based off of like how much cognitive energy they deserve. And I think in this case, like the IgA nephropathy discussion was probably one in which the diarrhea was holding too large of a space against the renal injury. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, um, and so I think that that for me is one thing that I'm that I'm going to be taking away from it, as is the um, uh, uh, ever humbling and ever growing illness strip of acute anti or of acute retroviral syndrome. I think like um, it is totally plausible to say that this was a protracted course of acute retroviral syndrome. Usually, um, one to two or you know a few weeks of a flu-like illness can be characterized by upper respiratory infections systemic um, systemic inflammatory symptoms, myalgias, rash, but can also have end organ manifestations in terms of things like abdominal pain and diarrhea. And again, I, I think it is, it, is, it is plausible, particularly given how high this patient's viral, viral load was, that, that, that the diarrhea may end up being explained by the acute sero, sero conversion process. And the fact that when we see a young person with risk factors who has a flu-like illness, right, um, many, many viral infections come into the, come, come, come to mind. And I think always an important reminder to think about sending an HIV test in those scenarios, um, uh, because there are many patients who we can potentially catch, um, and ultimately diagnose and start on antiretroviral therapy the way that this patient was, if we think about HIV with that acute, um, uh, uh initial acute viral syndrome here. So I think like both, both the Illness script for HIV associated nephropathy and the acute retroviral syndrome have been have been um, uh, hugely augmented by this case. So thank you all so much for this. Um, uh, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who joined today, to all of you VCU residents. Thank you for becoming a part of the VMR community in a new way today. It was an absolute delight to get to think through this case with you. Um, I will turn it over to Brody for the teaching points, and then we'll um, we'll let Robbie take us home after. First, I would like to take a moment to say that this is an amazing case and I love making teaching points. I'll keep it brief because we are kind of running out of time. So important points, chronic diarrhea uh, not, can be due to non-inflammatory causes, which could be secretory, osmotic, and malabsorptive. Inflammatory causes uh, could be infectious like Giardia, Cryptosporidium, TB, endemic fungi, and HIV. And here it, it, it should be pertinent to keep in mind to check the immune status of the patient and uh, and keep some of those opportunistic infections on your mind. Uh, and the non-infectious causes could be uh, a cancer like lymphoma and uh, inflammatory causes autoimmune like sarcoid or IBD. Uh, GI and renal uh, could be from a simple volume loss from diarrhea, which could cause AKI, but then other causes on your radar should be HUS, uh, nephrotic syndrome brought about by hepatitis or any, any kind of autoimmune diseases 
oxalate nephropathy. And then Ravi mentioned villus adenoma in the rectum can cause a devastating kidney injury, which Anne-Marie called micotric wet velox syndrome. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but the art could also be secondary to vascular disease like PAN. GI nephrotic syndrome association. So IG nephropathy could be triggered from a GI infection, like it could be from a pharyngitic infection, could be also be associated with celiac. Mm -hmm. And nephrotic syndrome can be followed by uh, hepatitis and uh, HIV, which can have acute retroviral syndrome and, and diarrhea. And then oh. that jumps on to what are the HIV associated nephropathies, which could be due to soon after uh, zero conversion or during development of AIDS could be to have uh, associated issues in the glomerulus to tubular to vascular. Glomerulus can have a uh, nephrotic, nephritic, or a smoldering CKD. And a uh, picture that you could see uh, on the ultrasounds could be large kidneys, but also keep diabetes in mind because that's the most common cause of large kidneys. And that's all, that's all I could get, but uh, I guess there are more points lying around, but yeah. Brody, I don't know if there's more points worth, in, uh, worth emphasizing. That was an absolutely superb summary of, of, of the teaching points. Thank you. And, and uh, thanks to Emery for organizing this, for Jack for hanging out with me today, for Kelly for uh, subscribing alongside uh, Brody's uh, teaching points, and to our um, new and dear friends from VCU, dude, Jonathan and Marina. It was a delight to hang out with you today. And a shout out to Dr. Michelle Brooks, who I saw was uh, in the audience too. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Hello, hello. Um, all right, y'all. Well, we hope to have you around on VMR um, in the near future. And know you can join us anytime. This is free for anybody. So um, if you feel inclined to nerd out more, um, we do this every day. Hope to see you around. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye,